Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, one of my favourite subjects in many ways, because uh, when I was doing my degree in archaeology, I had to do a whole year on Anglo-Saxon archaeology, including studying this particular site, the site of Sutton Hoo. But to start off with, I want you to take you back to the very first class I did in this course, in which I talked about how archaeology developed in England as a way of finding out about what these sites were, how old they were. And some significant characters, just to remind you about, uh, William Stukeley, for example, an antiquarian rather than an archaeologist. He's interested in the past. He's not really a, an excavator. But he made a very important uh, discovery, or observation, if you like, uh, in the early 18th century, when looking at a group of barrows or burial mounds, which he could see in England, he was able to say that these must be pre-Roman in date. Now, these are barrows or burial mounds. The general size of them is about 15 metres in diameter. Uh, they're very rarely more than two metres high. The Turkish word is pumulus for this type of thing. What Stukeley saw in the barrows at Oakley Down was that this Roman road cut across one of the barrows. So therefore, it had to be pre-Roman. Well, this idea that the barrows were pre-Roman had to be tested by various people. Uh, here's a photograph of the Oakley Down bar barrows. The large one there is a bit more than two metres high, but generally 15 metres diameter, two metres high. And what we find happening towards the end of the 18th century is people start to dig into barrows, partly because they know they are burial mounds, partly because they think there's going to be gold and treasure inside them, but technically to find objects in them which would indicate their date. And I talked about Brian Fawcett, who dug over 670 barrows in a very short period of time. These days we would take a year just to excavate one. He excavated 670 in about five years. Um, he was living in an area we call Kent, it's right in the southeast of England, and he wanted to find out what day the barrows were. He thought some might be pre roman some might be Dark Age in date. Now, the Dark Ages is the name we give to the period between when the Romans left England in about AD 410 to when the first English history was written, which is in the middle of the 8th century, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. We call that period the Dark Ages. Dark because we have no history. Well, Fawcett found that some of the barrows, or most of the barrows, contained objects of iron. And in the early 19th century, um, early 18th century, it was believed the Romans introduced iron to Britain, so therefore the barrows must be of Dark Age date, if not actually Anglo-Saxon, the people who settled in Britain uh, in the 5th century. And I also talked about James Douglas, who went to do more barrows to test this idea, and again, found that in Kent, in that area in the southeast of England, most of the barrows were, in fact, of Anglo-Saxon Dark Age date. They had objects of iron in them. Uh, but a few of them certainly had stone tools or bronze tools in them, which suggested that they were pre-Roman in date. So what we find happening basically through the uh, late 18th century and the early 19th century is people going around digging up barrows. You can dig a barrow in half a morning. This is James Douglas's method of excavation and there's Douglas holding the skull of the poor person buried in that barrow. Here's another view of an early 19th century excavation. And we find this tradition of barrow digging going right through into the mid-19th century, not really with very much organisation. It was during this period of investigation, what date are the barrows, that Sutton Who first comes into the archaeological record. In about 1860, a group of local antiquarians decided to look at the 20 or so barrows they could see at Sutton Who. 
they'd already, ex already excavated some burrows at a place called Snape. And they found that these were actually of uh, Iron Age, uh, of um, Dark Age dates. Snape is about 20 kilometers from Southern Who. Well, this is what the barrows at Southern Who look like. And you can see from this aerial photograph the holes in the top of some of them where, quite obviously, they've been robbed in the past. Ignore these. These were dug during the Second World War to stop German aeroplanes from landing at Southern Who if the Germans ever decided to actually invade England. Well, he dug into several of these Sutton Hoo barrows. We don't know exactly how many. This is a photograph of a contemporary excavation not far from Sutton Hoo, so you have to imagine a scene like this at 1860 in Sutton Hoo. The antiquarians who dug at Sutton Hoo found that all the barrows had been robbed. The only thing they said that they found, we know that they found quite a lot of things because they left some bits and pieces behind, but they said that they found some strange iron objects, iron nails or screws. So this at least gave them the evidence that these barrows at Sutton who were Dark Age in date rather than belonging to the Stonehenge, Stone Age. Nobody took any more interest in, in the Barrows at Sutton Hoo until the 1930s when this lady and her husband became owners of the site. Edith Pretty and Mr. Pretty, not much is known about Mr. Pretty, had gone on their honeymoon to Egypt. They'd visited the tomb of Tutankhamun and they came back to live at Sutton Hoo. And shortly after Mr. Pretty died, Mrs. Pretty by then had a son. She gave birth at the age of, I think, 42, which is incredibly remarkable for the 1930s. Uh, she started to have these vivid dreams in which she saw a funeral procession, people walking towards the barrows of Sutton Hoo. And she claimed that one night when she was walking around her land, she saw the ghostly figure of a warrior who looked like a king standing on one of the uh, barrows there. So she became convinced that the dream, the vision of the warrior, indicated the barrows, contained the bodies of somebody very important. So she employed a dowser to find out what was there. Now, what's a dowser? Well, a dowser is a person who uses, has special skills that nobody else has, or very few people have. Um, they claim that they can walk along with two pieces of wood or two pieces of metal and the spirit world will go bing, make these pieces of wood or metal go in a cross shape. Normally when they find water underneath the ground, but also when they find gold and silver underground. And this is a modern dowser uh, at work with his dowser's jacket on just to prove he's a real, genuine, professional dowser, not just somebody who's taken some money off you for one or other reason. Anyway, so she got a dowser to check the mounds at uh, Sutton Hoo, and he said, there's gold in these mounds, you must excavate them. So Mrs. Pretty got in touch with the local amateur archaeologist, a man called Basil Brown. And she said, Basil, I'd like you to start working on the Sutton Hoo Barrows. I want you to start on the biggest one. Well, Basil looked at the biggest one. It was something like um, 10 meters in diameter. And he thought, no, I'm not going to do this one. And anyway, it looks as if somebody's already dug a hole into it. So I'll look at some of the others. Uh, how am I going to do this? Uh, you can have my gardeners, and the gardeners will bring along their gardening equipment, and you can start excavating the barrows. So Basil Brown convinced Mrs. Pretty that basically there was no point in excavating the largest one. It was better to start off with one of the smaller ones. So Basil Brown started work on what was already called mound number two, and here he is in his typical overcoat working away in mound number two. He discovered, well, sorry, he started on mound number three. When he got into mound number three, he discovered this had been robbed in the past, as he suspected, but there was actually some rather interesting objects there, pieces of pottery and things like that, and rivets. Rivets of a type he knew were used to make a clinker-built ship. Now a clinker-built ship 
is when you put the planks on the side of the ship, they overlap each other and you use these rivets to fasten the ship together. Basil Brown knew that when they worked at Snape in 1862, they had found the remains of an Anglo-Saxon ship with rivets there. So he realised that this mound at Sutton Hoo, mound number two, must have contained a wooden ship at some point in the past. He also knew that just about 20 years before, of course, there had been this remarkable discovery uh, in Norway at a place called Useberg, a complete Viking ship, 8th century later in date. You can just see the burial chamber inside this. Wonderfully preserved. You can still go and visit it uh, in Oslo Museum. There's three Viking ships to see there. And you can see here, this is built the same way. It's the clinker-built uh, method of construction. So Basil Brown knew that at least one of the barrows at Sutton Hoo was going to be Dark Age in date. He knew that the earlier diggers had found iron nails in another barrow, so he thought he was probably excavating in the same one. Then he did a bit more work, and in Mound 3, again, it had been robbed. Everything was very badly disturbed, but he found this. This is a, an iron axe head. It's about that big, but it's a specific type of iron axe. It's a Francisca. It's a flowing axe. A type of axe that was used by the people of what the Anglo-Saxons called Franklin. We would call it France. You see a modern reconstruction, and that's basically how it was used in battle. You just threw it towards your enemy and hoped it got them straight in the face. If it didn't, it hit their shield. They couldn't get it out of their shield. They had to throw their shield away. So then you had your spear and your sword, and you could deal with them quite happily like that. Well, Basil Brown found all these bits and pieces. He excavated another mound, another one of the smaller mounds. This is mound number two with the ship rivets in down there. He excavated these two as well. And he found more evidence that these barrows were all of Anglo-Saxon date, at least the ones he excavated. So Mrs. Pretty got very, very enthusiastic. She said, you really got to go and dig mound number one, the biggest. So in 1939, he starts working again, May 1939, and he starts working on mound number one. And very quickly, what he finds in a very sandy soil are iron rivets in lines. Now sandy soils are very acidic. They will destroy almost anything organic. What Basil Brown realized he had was basically a ship that had been buried in the ground, complete. He could see the lines of iron rivets, all the wood had gone, but he knew he had basically a ship burial like the one found at Snape, like the one found at Uzeberg. And so he keeps on working in a very, very careful way until he gets towards the centre of this. And there he finds what he recognises as the remains of what had been a wooden hut, a wooden shed, clearly a burial chamber, with no evidence that anybody had ever excavated this before. It had not been robbed. Well, by this time, news of the discoveries at uh, Sutton Hoo had started to spread. And a man called Charles Phillips at Cambridge University heard that Brown had found Anglo-Saxon artefacts and the remains of a ship. He immediately came running down to see what was going on. He saw that Brown had just got to the burial chamber and he moved in, literally moved in, and convinced Mrs. Pretty now, Brown doesn't know what he's doing. He's an amateur archaeologist. What you need are the best archaeologists of the day, the British Museum to help. So poor old Basil Brown was not allowed to come within 10 metres of the burial chamber for the rest of the excavation. He never touched any of the objects we're about to see. So here's Charles Phillips and his team having taken over the excavation. I love the fact he's smoking his pipe. Uh, well, today we use radiocarbon radio dating, and if you have a cigarette or 
pipe ash landing on something, it ruins the carbon-14 deity. And that's Mrs. Pretty, actually, sitting up there watching the excavation take place. Well, they looked at what Brown had found and discovered that he found the remains of a collapsed wooden structure, a burial chamber. We can reconstruct its appearance. This had been built in the middle of the ship. You can see the sides of the ship coming up like that. The weight of thousands of tons of sandy soil had caused this to collapse. That meant that everything inside the burial chamber was really in very bad condition. Lots of it was broken up. But the moment they started excavating the burial chamber, they began to see this was something rather unusual. There were, for example, the remains of some bronze bowls, and they still had pieces of cloth sticking to them. Now, as I said, sandy soil destroys anything organic. But if it's in touch with metal, the impression will survive. And it was possible to see that these pieces of cloth were patterned, probably originally coloured. But the patterning on them was parallel, could only be uh, other examples were known of from Egypt in the Byzantine period and from Scandinavia in the Dark Age period. There was also the remains of a chessboard, wooden uh, spear halves with these spear heads on them. But then when they started to remove all these things, these had obviously fallen from the walls of the burial chamber over what was inside. They started to make some really exceptional discoveries. One of the first things they found, for example, was this. It's a whetstone. A whetstone is a type of stone you can use for sharpening a knife. It's a very fine-grained stone. But this wasn't an ordinary whetstone. It's got human heads carved on either hand. It's got a bronze uh, foot with a red stone ball in the bottom and a bronze stag on top of an iron ring at the top. This is a pretty exceptional find. You can get some idea of the size of it. This is something like 45 centimetres high. Well, what we find in many northern European societies, but also in other societies as well, the symbol a ruler would normally carry with him was a scepter. A large ornamental stone or ornamented piece of wood. We still see this type of thing in modern armies. A general carries a long piece of wood with lots of gold wrapped, wrapped around it. It's a symbol of authority. So this started Phillips and the other excavators thinking that actually what they had was not just an undisturbed Dark Age Anglo-Saxon burial chamber, but a burial chamber of somebody like a ruler. When they started to look at more and more things within the burial chamber, they found one of the next things they found were the remains of a wooden shield, originally covered with leather, one meter in diameter. This had been decorated with various pieces of bronze, but the bronze had all been gilded. It had been covered with gold. So this is again a sign that this is a very unusual grave. The center of the shield is called the shield boss. And this is what it looks like. It's gilded bronze, so it looks like it's actually gold. But what's, and it's mixed up with some silver, which has gone purple. But what was really fascinating is, in the centre, the use of these red stones there. These red stones are called garnets. Garnets are semi-precious stones. They're not really worth a lot of money. It's very difficult to actually get a very big garnet. But the Anglo-Saxons loved garnets. Anything decorated with garnets, basically, is Anglo-Saxon, from the Dark Age period. Garnets were never popular in Scandinavia or Europe. Anglo-Saxons loved them for reasons that we don't understand. So this started to hint more and more, though this is a very important Anglo-Saxon burial. But the decoration on the shield was also fascinating. 
a highly stylized eagle. If you look carefully, you can see you've got lots of lines going in and out there. A continuous line. It's actually two snakes together biting each other's tails. It's a type of decoration we call interlace. An interlace decoration like this is entirely Anglo-Saxon. So yes, more and more evidence coming up that this is an Anglo-Saxon burial, an important one. That was the eagle symbol. On the other side of the shield was this dragon emblem. It's actually a six-winged dragon. Again, you can see the interlace decoration. It's bronze covered with gold. And you see the use of the garnets for the eyes and for the uh, wing sockets as well. Well, even as they were excavating this particular shield, the remains of this shield, they knew that there was something else like it in another in country altogether. In Sweden, South Sweden, a place called Vendel, a cemetery area full of barrows that was excavated in the 19th century, very badly, unfortunately, but produced a lot of material that could be dated to the 6th, 7th and 8th centuries, just before the Viking period. Some of the shields at Vendel were decorated in the same type of way. In fact, the workmanship on this eagle decoration from Vendel is identical to the eagle decoration on the Southern Hoo shield. It's possible that the same person made this eagle as the one we have on the Southern Hoo shield. So the evidence is pointing to not just a local Anglo-Saxon ruler, no, the evidence is not there yet, but this is somebody who has got contacts with southern Sweden. Well, as more and more work was done, more surprising discoveries. It's a bronze bowl, but not just an ordinary bronze bowl. It's about 15 uh, centimetres in diameter. It's a bronze bowl of a type that was only ever made in Egypt by the Copts, the Christian people of Egypt in the Roman and the Byzantine period before the Arab invasion of the 640s. There was also something else that was rather odd. A large hanging bowl. You can see the rings up there. This would have been suspended from the roof of it or ceiling of a building. But the decoration on this is purely British. Now, what I mean by purely British in this sense is you have to remember that the Anglo-Saxons, who give us the name England, only occupy basically what is England. And the original inhabitants of Britain, after the Anglo-Saxon started coming in, moved into Scotland and into Wales and also into Ireland. This is what we mean by British in this context. So this is a bowl that was probably made in somewhere like Wales or Scotland. You see how the mystery is deepening. There are all these bits and pieces in the Sutton Hoo site, Mound 1, that indicate quite extensive contacts, trade contacts. This is a, a detail of an enameled plaque from the hanging bowl. This is Millefiori. Millefiori is a type of glass in which you put together different rods of glass of different colours and you fuse them together and then you can chop it up like that and use this for decoration. But the size of that square there is less than one centimetre. This is absolutely microscopic work to a certain extent. As they went further into the burial chamber they found the remains of what had been a lyre. Again with gilt bronze decoration and garnets. It could be reconstructed. It fitted in with what was known of Anglo-Saxon society. There were also a pair of drinking horns. These, the horns themselves don't survive, but the gilt bronze at the mouth and at the foot of the horn did, and it was possible to reconstruct their size. They are big. They are about 80 centimeters across. These were made from the horns of a type of wild bull known as the aurochs. The aurochs in the Dark Age period only existed in Central Europe. So these must have been imported from Central Europe. 
You'll notice, by the way, that you cannot put one of these drinking horns down. Once, it's like one of those ritons. Once you've got it and it's filled, you, you've got to drink it, basically. These were used for drinking mead. Mead is uh, an alcoholic drink made from honey. And that was the traditional drink in Anglo-Saxon uh, times. There were also a set of cups for water or for wine, much smaller. And they would fit into the hand. Again, the wood had gone, and the wood in this case had gone, but the surviving pieces of metal indicated the basic shape of these. And again, this typical Anglo-Saxon interlace. More surprising discovery is at the end of the burial chamber, a complete set of silver bowls. The largest of them had stamps on it, indicating it was made in Constantinople under Anastasius. Anastasius was emperor from 491 to 518. This was an important piece of evidence because this could not have got in the burial chamber before 518. So the burial had to be after 518. It's a very important piece of evidence. You could say 491 if you want to stretch the point, but somewhere uh, between that general period. There were the remains of what had been an iron chainmail suit. Uh, chainmail made from rings of uh, roughly one centimetre diameter. Chainmail is very good at resisting a stabbing blow and a slashing blow. It actually bends with the blow. Uh, typical armour of the Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, the actual iron mail was just a big rusty mass, that's what they found it, but it would have been a shirt like this. And then at the other end of the chamber, they found a whole series of collection, a collection of rusted pieces of iron covered, in some cases, with gilt bronze, so bronze with uh, gold over the top, but some of them had been covered with tin. They had been tinned. Well, the purpose of tinning something is to make it look like silver. And it could be seen from the surviving parts that this was a helmet. It had been completely broken up when the burial chamber had collapsed. Not all the pieces survived, but enough survived to allow reconstruction to start. And that is what it looked like. This was in many ways the most significant discovery that the excavators made while they were still working on the material. You can see all the missing parts there. This is the actual uh, remains of the helmet. That's what it would have looked like. Iron body to it, gilt bronze decoration, and all these separate decorated plaques covered with tin to make it look like silver. This is one of the actual uh, plaques as it survives today. Very strange design showing these warriors wearing horned helmets. A kind of Scandinavian thing rather than Anglo-Saxon thing. And wonderful details like this. Battle scenes going around the helmet. Here you've got a warrior on a horse. He's charging down his enemy. He's got his little assistant at the back there. And you can see these are all made from the same stamp. So this has been made by a very a uh, clever workman. You can see interlace down here, and you can see just up here, again, another series of these riders' uh, reliefs there. <coughs> What's even more fascinating when we look at the helmet is it's really absolutely beautiful design. A full-face helmet. Now, when you look at the nose, gilt bronze with its moustache there, it's wearable, the holes to, so you can breathe, but you, what you actually have is a winged dragon. You can just see the head of the dragon there, and those are the wings. These are silver, and they end in boar's heads. The boar is a very um, popular animal in Anglo-Saxon uh, mythology. And this dragon faces another one, which forms the crest of the helmet, going over the, the top of the helmet to give extra protection. Well, again, even when they found the crushed remains of this, they knew that there were other helmets that were rather similar at Vendel. But the helmets at Vendel 
although they've got the same stylized dragons on them, you can see on both of these, these are not full face helmets. A full face helmet is something that belongs to somebody very important. The Vendel helmets, none of them are decorated with the relief plaques. The Sutton Who helmet is something very, very special. Well, other parts of the burial chamber produce ten bowls, all with a cross sign in them. Well, is this a Christian cross, or is it just a simple cross design? Uh, there's a lot of argument about that. It could be a Christian cross, it might not be. But next to the bowls were two silver spoons. These are the most significant objects from the excavation. These are the two artifacts, objects, that help us interpret what's going on here. When you look at the silver spoons, you can see they have names written on them in Greek. Now, they, they look gold in this light, and that's because of the, um, the lights that we use to take the photograph. They are silver. But if you look at the one spoon, you can see it's got the Greek name or Greek letters for the name Saulos, and here the name Paulos. So these spoons refer to a man called Saul and to a man called Paul. Well, Saul is referred to in the Bible. Saul is the Jew who decided to go around and kill all the Christians, or as many as he could, after Christ was crucified. He comes from a place called Tarsus, so you might know about him. On the road to Damascus, he had an amazing religious experience. He converted to Christianity and took the name Paul. Then Paul went around the whole of Anatolia, converting people, mostly Jews to start off with, to Christianity. Paul is, in a sense, the first of the modern Christians. Jesus Christ was part of a Jewish sect, but Paul is the person who really gets Christianity going. Well, these two spoons, Saulos and Paulos, seem to signify that the person buried, or the Sutton Who uh, uh, burial chamber, uh, contained gifts that represented or had been given to somebody who had converted from paganism, belief in all the old gods, to Christianity. The spoon being given to symbolize that conversion. Saul to Paul. So that's a pretty important find. Let's continue. On one side of the burial chamber, with the remains of a one meter long iron sword, still in its leather scabbard, again decorated with gilt bronze. The remains just of the wooden handle, gold pommel on the top, of course, again with these garnets. The sword belt buckle, which is about five, um, eight centimeters long, solid gold. All with garnet decoration. Now remember, each one of these little panels here is roughly just over ooh, a centimetre or so big. This is workmanship of the highest possible quality. And the careful selection of the colours. Purple, 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 red, purple, purple. This is really high class workmanship. At the top of the burial chamber were these. These are both 10 centimetres or so long, 5 centimetres long. They're, they're shoulder clasps. These would have been fitted to, if you like, a leather waistcoat, which would have been worn over the iron chainmail armour. Now, again, very elaborately decorated. You can see the different um, cells, as it were, with the garnets and things like that in there. Um, I noted this down because I thought you might like to know there are 498 separate pieces of, gar of garnet in that one. Doesn't look like it, but we'll look at the detail in a moment. And there are 514 in the other. There's also millefiori glass. And again, we're talking about something that's only slightly more than five or six centimetres wide. So imagine the workmanship involved in making that gold surround to put that glass in the centre there. 
The shoulder uh, fasteners also have animal designs on them. It takes a little bit of working out, but if you apply yourself to it, you can see the heads of the animals there, the bodies of the animals there, and the bodies of the animals there. Very typical of Anglo-Saxon uh, art. In the centre of the burial chamber was this. A solid gold buckle. It's just about 11 centimetres long. It weighs 480 grams. It's a working buckle. It was attached to a leather belt at some point. Everything works in this. Beautifully decorated with this interlaced design. And on this slide you can see the complexity of all this. See here you've got one head of one snake. You can follow its body all the way around. He's biting the body of this snake. You've got the same type of thing there, and if you look all around here. But we're talking about something that's, you know, sort of really quite small compared to the slide there. Exquisite piece of workmanship. Next to the big gold buckle, the remains of what had been a leather purse. The leather had decayed, but the gold surround on top of the purse still survived. Again, with gold and garnet um, decoration, uh, uh, decoration. Here you've got two animals on either side of um, a man there. You've got two eagles here with baby eagles in between them. Interlaced decoration there. Inside, uh, that's a detail of the uh, eagles there. Now again, just think of the, the size of this. I mean, with, with these really small pieces of garnet are only about two or three millimeters big. This is somebody who, if he had a microscope to work with, could have done even better work. But this is workmanship of the highest quality. Inside the purse were a collection of coins, coin blanks, and some gold bars. There were 37 separate coins, each one made at a different city in Frankland, modern France. Now, that indicates they've been deliberately collected to make a set. If you travel around Europe today, you would find it very difficult to get 37 coins, euros, all issued in Germany or Greece, if they still have some, uh, or anywhere like that. It's very difficult to actually get 37 separate coins from you know, one particular place. But there are also three blank pieces of gold the same size and the weight as the gold coins. And from this it was deduced that this is probably the payment for the rowers of the ship to take it to the afterworld. Forty ghostly rowers, but the man that steers the ship, he's the most important one, so he gets the gold ingots. He's much more important. What would the burial chamber excavated? It's possible to actually reveal the ship itself. Uh, the impression of the ship, the indications of the rivets, that's what it basically su survived. And it's basically showed that the, the ship had been something in the order of 27 metres long, pointed at each end, probably about four metres wide in the middle. Uh, here's another view of it so you can get some idea of the size. Very similar, in fact, to this particular ship. The Needham ship, it was found in the 1860s in Denmark. Clinker built. We now know that it was built of wood that was cut down in 310, 320. We don't know when the ship was built. But the Southern Who ship would have looked something like this, except the Southern Who ship probably had a sail as well. Well, the Second World War started almost immediately after the excavation finished. First of all, they had to have a treasure trove inquiry. The old law in England was that if you found gold or silver in the ground, and if it had been left there with no intent to recover it, it went to the crown. If you found gold and silver in the ground, and obviously somebody had lost it, like a few coins or something like that, uh, then it would be split between the, the, the crown and the person who owned the land or the finder. Well, in this particular case, the Southern Who ship burial, the contents valued in 1939 at five million pounds, so quite a lot, 
This had obviously been buried with no intent to recover it at all. So it belonged to the Crown. But Mrs. Pretty gave it to the British Museum for the British people. The Second World War about to start. But with the Second World War continuing, people start wondering, well, what does all this mean? What is this? What have we got at Mount One? The thing was that everything that was found in Mount One was of a very, very high quality. Armour, decorated jewellery, the sort of thing that you would expect to find a ruler wearing. So, probably a king. But no matter how hard they looked, they found no trace of a body in Mound One. No bones, no teeth or anything like that. So the excavators at first started to think that Mound One at Sutton Hoo was a cenotaph. A cenotaph is a monument erected or built for somebody whose body you don't have. So it's a ceremonial burial place. Uh, you may not have the body because it's lost completely or it was destroyed or buried somewhere else. But the thing about Sutton Hoo is, of course, you have a ship burial with grave goods, which is pagan, but some of the objects in the grave have Christian symbols on them, Saulos and Paulos. So this has to be a cenotaph of somebody who is somewhere in between. This made, given the date of the latest coin, 626, 25, suggested, when work started being done on the uh, material, that this was a cenotaph made in honour of King Eorthwald. I've put a P in there, actually it should be an Anglo-Saxon letter like that, which is pronounced T-H. So it's Eorthwald, not Eorpweld. King Eorpweld, King of the East Angles. East Anglia is the area where Sutton who is. The East Angles were the people who lived there. We know that he converted to Christianity in 626. And we know that he was killed in 627, although there is a possibility of a later date, 632. The sources are not very clear. And his body was either thrown into a river and it was destroyed. So it seemed possible when they first started looking at the material that this might be a cenotaph for Eofweld, built by members of his family. They put all his personal possessions in there, whether it was pagan or his uh, weapons or, or Christian. That was it. The only problem with this theory was Yorkwell was a relatively unimportant and short-lived king. He was only king 624, 627. The quality of the material that was found in Sutton Hoo, the extensive contacts with Scandinavia, with the British part of um, uh, Britain, with Egypt, Constantinople, Syria, all this suggested that if this was a cenotaph, it was somebody rather more important than the York world. It was difficult to say. Nobody had ever found anything like this in England before. Nobody knows what a burial of an Anglo-Saxon king should look like. But when people started looking at the material, after the Second World War, they studied the plans of where everything had been found. And they realised that the plans suggested that the sword might have been lying on one side of a body with the purse over the waist, the helmet to another side, the shoulder clasped where the shoulders would have been. So had there actually been a body there? Now the soil at Sutton Hoo, as I said, is very acidic. It could have destroyed all traces of a human body, although normally teeth will survive, but it can destroy teeth as well. So in this case, the pagan method of burial, the mixture of pagan and Christian objects, made it possible that this was actually the grave of Eofwell's father, King Radvald. Well, we know that King Radvald converted to Christianity, that could have been when he would have received all these lovely gifts from Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor and things like that, bowls with Christian crosses, the spoon. But then he converted back to being a pagan. Well, that would fit in. 
You've got a grave with this mixture of bits and pieces. We know that Redwall was a mighty warrior. You look at the weapons in there, these, I mean, a one metre long sword is not an easy thing to uh, use. Uh, we know that he ruled for a long period. We know that in 616, he effectively became king of all the other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So that would time with all the very uh, high quality of the objects in Mound 1. The question was, of course, had Mound 1 ever contained a body? Well, they excavated the Mound 1 again in 1965-71 to 71 to try and find some evidence. Didn't come up with anything at all. But the 1980s saw the development of a very nice, clever piece of archaeological testing method. What we call phosphate analysis. It was decided to re-excavate Sutton Hoo to get better measurements of the ship, but also take the opportunity to use the method of phosphate analysis to see if there had ever been a body there. Human and animal bodies all contain roughly 1% phosphorus. It's natural. When the body decays, that goes into the soil where the body was. That remains there forever. When they did phosphate analysis, if you do phosphate analysis, you can see if there's been a body there, human or animal. And phosphate analysis of the burial chamber confirmed that there had been a body there. We don't know if it was an animal or a human. Phosphate analysis won't tell you that. But the amount of phosphorus in the soil was what you would expect from there having been a human body. So if Sutton Hoo Mound 1 was a royal burial, it was probably that built for King Radveld. But the thing is, what we must not forget, is we don't know what the grave of an Anglo-Saxon king might look like. Mound 1 might have been the burial of another family member of the kings of the East Angles. We simply don't know. But as it is, the generally accepted theory at the time now is that Mound 1 originally contained the beautifully built burial chamber like this, with the body of probably King Radveld laid out there, with his sword and personal weapons on one side, He's wearing his purse, he's wearing his gold buckle, he has his leather waistcoat on, his helmet up there. Hanging on the wall, textiles from Egypt, from Syria, from Scandinavia. His body was covered with some of these textiles, his drinking horns laid over his legs. The big pile of silver bowls at one end of the, the whole grave. And you can see here just where the gold buckle would have been the purse lying by his side like that, the chest set at the end there, and finally at the very end, this symbol of royal authority, the scepter. So that's the story of Sutton Hoo. And do look carefully at the reading about the date of Sutton Hoo, because of a problem with the coins. <laughs>